Hello everybody, I'm Stephen Elliott from the Forest Restoration Research Unit of Chiang Mai University and today I would like to offer the following topic for discussion by this panel session. How should we match forest restoration techniques with different levels of site degradation? All over the world, millions of people are planting billions of trees in the hope that these trees will suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and reduce the greenhouse effect that is causing global warming. But is all this tree planting activity really necessary? In some places, natural regeneration works very well to restore the forest without any tree planting. So the question now becomes, how do we know where to rely on natural regeneration, where we should be planting trees, and where perhaps we should be combining both of these techniques? So what we've done at FORU is to try to define five stages of degradation, and each of these stages is separated by a tipping point. One is the least degraded condition, and stage five is the most degraded condition. And when you reach the tipping point from one stage down to the next stage, um, a considerable increase in effort in, in terms of forest restoration is required. So let's start with stage one degradation. This one is selective logging. And if you go into a selectively logged area, in most cases, um, these areas have everything they need to undergo natural regeneration. There are plenty of seedlings growing on the forest floor. There are seed sources nearby from unlogged areas and there are animals like birds, even, maybe even elephants and civets are present to move the seeds from those remnant fragments of forest into the restoration site. So what to do with these areas? Really protection is all that is necessary. We need to prevent encroachment, obviously, because if you don't do that, these sites will slide down to stage two or stage three degradation. We need to keep out the fire. We need to keep out, or at least co to control the numbers of cattle in these areas because they will eat the regenerating seedlings. And we need to make sure that there's no hunting of those essential seed dispersing animals that will bring in the seeds of um, tree species from the surrounding remnant fragments of forest. Tipping point one is reached when the canopy becomes more open and light intensity at ground level therefore increases. This stimulates the growth of herbaceous weeds which grow up and start to smother the natural generation. Under this circumstance, it's not enough simply to protect the natural generation, although of course you must continue to do that. It becomes necessary to actually assist the growth of that natural regeneration and to ensure its survival. Assisted natural regeneration is called ANR and mostly that involves cutting back the weeds and sometimes also applying fertilizer. Where natural regeneration is dense, the ANR technique works very well. Here you can see our trial site in Southern Thailand and it's full of natural regeneration but that natural regeneration is being suppressed by the weeds. After about six months of cutting back the weeds and applying fertilizer and doing a bit of mulching, the site closed canopy. And, and 11 years after applying ANR to this site, you can see the forest has the look and feel of a natural forest. Tipping point two is reached when the amount of natural regeneration on the site slips below the critical threshold value, which is required to close canopy within about two to three years. In Northern Thailand, this is about 3000 stems per hectare. Under this circumstance, you still have to protect the remaining natural regeneration and may be assisted with ANR, but you also have to plant trees now to increase the natural regeneration from the amount already on site to the amount required to close canopy in two to three years. 
But luckily, you don't have to plant all the tree species that made up the original forest ecosystem because there are still seed dispersers in, on, on these kinds of landscapes and there are still remnant, um, remnant pieces of forest to act as seed sources. The tree species that we plant under these circumstances are called framework tree species and they are typically around 10% of the tree species that are characteristic of the reference forest but they are selected to have the following properties. Uh, first of all they have to have high survival and growth rates when planted out into dry open exposed areas like this one. They should have dense spreading crowns that will shade out the weeds and rapidly what we call recapture the site and they should produce perhaps fruit, nectar or perching sites to attract those seed dispersing animals to come into the restoration sites and drop the seeds of all the other species which we don't need to plant with this method. We plant about 20 to 30 of these framework tree species on each site augmenting the natural regeneration that's already there to achieve a final stocking density of about 3,000 trees per hectare. After planting, the trees receive doses of fertilizer and a weeding treatment at least three times in the first and second, second rainy seasons after planting. And of course, we take care of fire prevention during the dry season. Here are some of the results from our plots. This is our study site in May 1998, just before we started trialing the technique. And here we are in September 2006, everything 2016, everything on the left of the track is about 15 years old and everything on the right of the track is about nine years old. You can see this technique really does accelerate forest recovery. When you go inside of these plots, you can see massive amounts of natural regeneration. Most of these seedlings are coming back from seeds which were dispersed into the area by birds. Biodiversity recovery is rapid and carbon levels normalize in about 25 years. So the framework species technique depends on natural seed dispersal to recover biodiversity. And tipping point three is reached when that seed dispersal no longer operates efficiently, either because there are no seed sources left in the in the landscape or because hunting has extirpated the seed dispersing animals. Under those circumstances, instead of just planting 20 to 30 framework tree species, you have to plant nearly all the tree species that comprise the original reference forest ecosystem, and that's called maximum diversity methods or MDMs. Perhaps the best known of the maximum diversity techniques is the Miyawaki method invented by Professor Miyawaki who you see there on the right shaking my hand. His technique divides a restoration site up into potential natural vegetation units based on the soil and climatic conditions across the site and then matches species to those conditions. Saplings are grown in a nursery up to 30 to 50 centimeters tall and up to 90 species are planted on each individual site. Um, the technique is very intensive and uses very high planting densities up to uh, 30,000 trees per hectare or 60 centimetres apart. However, these very, very high tree planting densities could be regarded as overkill in some areas. This is the UPM Bintulu campus plot. It's 26 years old and the trees were planted at 6,000 per hectare. That's double the number we use for the framework species technique. And what you see here is that the trees are competing with each other and they are incredibly thin for trees of 26 years old. So the next tipping point is reached when the soil becomes so degraded, it becomes almost impossible to plant most tree species under these conditions. The treatment of these sites is to plant what we call nursery species 
that will function to improve the soil ecosystem before you can plant framework tree species or maximum diversity tree species. We are recommending two groups of trees to serve as nurse trees, one to take care of substrate structure and the other one to take care of substrate uh, nutrient levels. The first are the figs with their expansive root systems that push apart blocks of substrate, opening channels for water and oxygen to get into the substrate and feed the roots of the other trees. The legumes, of course, fix nitrogen and can greatly improve the nutrient status of the substrates. And here are the results of a mixture of legumes and figs on a highly, highly degraded limestone quarry in Lampang, not so far from the university. You can see it is possible to close canopy uh, within two and a half years using this technique. And the wildlife came in, in this case, uh, macaque monkeys came in to feed on the figs. And of course, as they did so, they were dropping the seeds of many other species into this site. So here's the whole concept uh, in a single, easy to understand diagram. We have the stages of the degradation one to five here, and the responses to those stages of degradation here. And the tipping points, just to remind you, the first one is when weeds start to suppress seed establishment. The second one is when there simply isn't enough uh, natural regeneration to close canopy. The third one between the framework species method and the maximum diversity methods is when there is insufficient seed dispersal to recover uh, biodiversity. And the fourth one is when even the soil becomes so degraded it cannot support many of the tree species that we want to plant. So at this point, you're probably wondering how to actually recognize on the ground when you're up against one of these tipping points. Of course, there are lots of online tools and assessment procedures available to help you to do just that. You can go to Google Earth, for example, to find out where the nearest forest is as a seed source. You can go and do a, a, a survey in the reference forest to find out what are the characteristic species of your reference forest. You can do a rapid site assessment in the restoration site to measure the pre-existing density of natural regenerants. And of course, you can consult local people for knowledge about what seed dispersing animals might be common in the area and uh, where to go to find seed trees to grow your planting stock. All of these procedures are explained in uh, a great deal of detail in Restoring Tropical Forests, a practical guide. You can download it completely free of charge from our website www.foru.org. That's it. I hope some of these ideas will stimulate some lively discussion to follow and thank you for listening.